Great, let's just wait two more minutes. The live is starting right now. Wonderful. Hey everyone, so thank you so much for coming in today. We're just waiting for a couple of people to trickle into our um, webinar today. Hey everyone, on. so thank you so much for coming in today. We're just waiting for a couple of people to trickle into our um, web. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, sorry about that. Okay, no, great. Okay. We're so, doing great. So as you're joining in, I wanted to take the time first to introduce our firm. We are Elise Law Firm. We are located in Miami, Florida. Uh, we are available for consultations. Our area of practice is immigration. So any immigration related inquiry that you might have, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Our phone number is 305 um, 371-8846. You can also email us at intro at elizelawfirm.com and uh, visit our website. We love uh, hearing from you directly if you want to just reach out via our website. Um, feel free to put in the chat the location where you're listening in from and uh, we'll be happy to reach out back to you after this uh, webinar. Great, so for everyone who's joining us, my name is Patricia Elise. I am the principal attorney here at Elise Law Firm. Um, and I am joined by Catalina. She is the head of our acquisition team. So if you do reach out to our firm and you sign up for a video call, you will be having your very own one-on-one -on -one with both Catalina and myself. So looking forward to hearing from you guys. We would love to hear back from you guys. Uh, the ways that you can reach out to us are written in the comments below. Uh, give me just one second to make sure that everyone has access to that information as well. Um, any questions or concerns immigration related, please feel free to reach out to us. Our phone number is again, 305-371-8846. We are uh, located in Miami, Florida, but we do serve the United States and outside of the United States, a lot of countries, we've, we're all over. So don't feel limited by the fact that we are in Miami. We are everywhere available to you. Um, also, please uh, keep in consideration that uh, we have different language speakers on our team. We are available to assist you in English, Spanish, and Haitian, Creole, and French. Um, That's a great with point. With that being said, yeah, that, that being said, attorney, how do you feel about getting started? Yeah, let's get let's get started and start focusing on the details of the fiance visa process. Sounds good to me. Okay. So if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation. All right, and here we go. So for today's topic of discussion, we will be we will be touching base on uh, the K-1 visa process, also known as how to bring your fiance into the US. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce you to our managing attorney. Uh, this is attorney Patricia Elise. You may know her uh, very well, in fact, from the very many media appearances that she's made. Uh, from NBC News, Afro Studio, So Karala, ABC News, as well as our article uh, that is published in Le Floridian twice a month, as well as uh, the many publications in many other sources. Uh, she has a bachelor's in communications from the University of Miami, and she graduated from the Miami School of Law, uh, Juris Doctor with Honors. So uh, you are getting the best of the best in the consultation that you will get. Um, keep in mind, she also has a master's in international sustainable international development from the University of Washington School of Law. So after our introduction, uh, we are Elise Law Firm located in Miami, Florida, and let's get started. Awesome. Thank you for that intro. So <laughs> let's talk about the K-1 visa. Um, the K-1 visa is the visa that permits a foreigner, someone that is physically outside of the United States, to come to the U.S. to marry their U.S. citizen spouse, okay? Now, 
before we go any further, I really want to emphasize not necessarily the K-1, but the visa part. Because a lot of people don't realize that the K-1 visa is only that. It's a permission. It's a piece of paper that is put on your passport once the process is done and approved that allows you to come physically to the US. Once you're physically in the United States, it doesn't guarantee you a status. There's two different things which is really important. There's the immigration visa that allows you to travel into the US and the K-1 visa only allows you to travel once into the United States, unlike other visas that we're familiar with, right? So for example, a tourist visa um, will allow you to travel back and forth for several years while the K-1 visa allows you to enter the country one time. Once you enter, that visa expires and you're not guaranteed an actual status in the United States up until an actual green card application is filed for you. So getting an approved K-1 visa that doesn't necessarily mean anything but that. It's a K-1 visa. It allows you to come into the U.S. to actually marry your U.S. citizen spouse. Um, and you have an obligation to get married within 90 days of your entry into the US. So I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with um, the very famous show about the K-1Bs, I believe it's 90 Day Fiance, right? Yeah. So everyone is has an idea. Um, someone goes on vacation in a foreign country, that person's a US citizen, falls in love, um, files for the K-1 visa, the person comes in and there's all this 90 days, 90 days, 90 days. So this 90 day requirement is very real and there's very real legal consequences um, as to whether you do end up getting married or you don't, okay? So you do have to get married within the 90 days. Attorney, before we move forward, I noticed you made a lot of emphasis on the US citizen portion of it. Does that mean that residents can or cannot apply for a K-1 visa for their fiance? That's a great question. So a lawful permanent resident of the U.S. or a green card holder is not able to file for a fiance visa on behalf of their significant other um, residing abroad. You have to be a U.S. citizen to be able to file for someone to get uh, granted that K-1 visa. Okay, and I see that we have our first question of the day. I'm sorry to keep you here, attorney. I just, uh, let's get it out of the way. So one of the questions from one of our viewers is, what happens if I don't get married within the 90 days? That's, um, okay, so that's a great question. If you do not get married within the 90 days, then you're not able to continue with only a green card application. So the way that it works is, Typically, when you're married to a United States citizen, the U U.S. citizen would file an I-130 petition on your behalf, which is a petition for an alien relative. The K-1 visa replaces that I-130. Mm. So if you enter the U.S. with an approved K-1, you no longer need that I-130. You can continue on and only file for the green card portion of the case. If you do not get married within the 90 days, and if let's say you get married 100 days later or 200 days later, you are able to continue to get your green card in the U.S., but you will have to also then file an I-130. Okay, um, so. <laughs> so, another, <laughs> so something else to consider also is if you're an immigrant and you're the beneficiary of a K-1 visa, your petitioner is the only person you can get married to. And your petitioner is the only person that can actually get you that green card, which is completely different from any other process in immigration. So if you come in with a tourist visa, you get married to someone, it doesn't work out, you marry your second spouse, you're still able to get your green card from that second spouse. With the K-1 visa, you are not allowed to do that. If your last entry into the United States was with, on a K-1 visa, then the green card application that you file has to be based on the marriage to the petitioner to that K-1 visa. So we can't jump from fiance From relationship to, to relationship, seeking that green card if your last entry into the U.S. was using a K-1 visa, 
That's correct. Okay, that is great to know, attorney. Okay, so um, moving on, who is eligible for this visa? Sure, so like we said, it has to be a US citizen petitioner, right? Mm -hmm. And that US citizen and yourself, um, neither of you guys are married and both of you guys are able to get married. So this is a really interesting point that some people overlook. Mm -hmm. um, immigration will review your marriage history, which means if you were married previously and you got divorced, you will have to submit your divorce documents from your first, second, third marriage, et cetera, but that divorce will have to be accepted by immigration. Now, this is really um, tricky sometimes because let's say you got married in the Dominican Republic and you wanna get divorced in the Dominican Republic or you wanna get divorced, for example, in Haiti. Um, the laws in, in those countries are very, um, they're not as rigid as the laws in the US for divorce. So it's very common, for example, to have a foreigner's divorce where neither party is physically in those countries. If you have a divorce that's done in a foreign country, but that divorce doesn't follow the laws of the US, the US does not have to recognize that divorce. So I've had situations where clients pursue a relationship to give someone a green card, but the divorce that they legally did abroad, for example, is not recognized by the US government. So they're not able to get married to the immigrant. Um, so, that's, so that's really important. If you've been married before and divorced, it's really important that you have your marriage history be reviewed by an immigration attorney so that you're certain that the divorce was done correctly and that you are able to continue to this new relationship with the immigrant and that immigration will recognize that. So neither party must be married. Um, both parties must have the ability to get married. Both also must have the intention of getting married once the immigrant is in the US within the 90 days as we spoke about. So here for the intention, it's very easy to prove. Both parties simply have to send a letter to USCIS stating under oath that it is their intent to get married within the immigrant's entry within 90 days. Um, you also wanna provide proof that the couple has met in person at least um, once in the last two years. Now, this has been a little tricky with COVID, not so much anymore, right? But during COVID, there were people who, they weren't able to see each other in the last two years when they filed. So what do you do there? Um, immigration does have exceptions to meeting the requirement of showing that you've met in person in the last two years, which is you have to show either an extra ordinary circumstance, right? Or that it would violate a custom in your religion that you were not that you were not able to physically meet in person. Got it. Um, with regards to that, um, you know, you're you're talking about a cultural requirement. What if I have somebody asking me a question right now, and they're saying, "What if my relationship is solely um, virtual?" So if you if you've never met the person physically, then you will most likely not be able to qualify for the K one unless you can show that there's real extra extraordinary circumstances in your specific case. And they really have to be extraordinary. It can't just be, I don't have the money to travel, um, I've been sick or I, you know something to that effect. It really has to be to the point where, for example, maybe your fiance is in a country, that's, there's a civil war, they don't have a passport, they're not able to travel to another country, you're not able to travel there, or maybe you have a medical condition if you get on a plane that you're not allowed to actually travel abroad. So it really, really has to be extraordinary or you have to show that due to cultural reasons, you really won't, due to your cultural cultural reason or religious reasons, you're not allowed to meet the person until the day of your wedding. This is very rare, but sometimes you'll find that, for example, in really conservative communities, 
um, conservative Islamic community, sometimes you're not able to actually meet the person you're going to marry until you're at the altar. So that's something to consider as well. Okay. Um, other requirements would be the income requirement must also be met. So it's not going to be as rigid as a green card um, application. And we spoke about this during our first webinar where we spoke about family petitions. But for the fiance visa process, um, you have to submit proof of your income and of your assets, but it's not going to be as rigid because when the person enters the U.S., you will also have to file a I-864, and we'll get into that later on in the presentation. But for example, if the petitioner is currently not working and they're worried about meeting income requirements and they're trying to weigh that should they file for a fiance visa or should they file for a green card, um, do they not have access maybe to a full sponsor? These are considerations that you want to kind of think over when you're making the decision, is a fiance visa process for me or do I wanna go ahead and file for a green card, either do an I-130 position and do it through the consulate or do I wanna do consular processing? So just keep that in mind. And obviously the last requirement is it has to be a bona fide relationship. What's a bona fide relationship? That means it's a real relationship that you've entered into um, and that you can show immigration. You're not entering into this relationship only to be able to get your papers in the US. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the explanation, attorney. I think that clarifies a lot on in terms of eligibility. Um, let's talk about what we can expect from the process itself. So there, there are four main steps when it comes to the fiance visa process. Mm -hmm. When it comes to getting your green card, it's really five steps, right? Because yeah. this process gets you all the way up to entering the United States. And then after that, um, you have to figure out, okay, how am I gonna move forward and actually get that green card? So the first step of the process is to complete the actual application for the fiance visa, which is the I-129F. With the application, you'll have to provide some background information about um, both the US citizen and also the immigrant, your fiance. So um, employment information, employment history, work history, travel history. Um, you also have to provide names of parents, um, biometric information, you'll have to answer some questions about criminal background, et cetera. With your form, you wanna to submit to immigration a very solid packet that shows that it's a bona fide relationship. How long have you guys known each other, the communication history? So here, this is where you can also, and we, I enjoy this process because I really get to be a little creative because as you may think, as you may know, each relationship is gonna be different. So some relationships, you'll have a lot of travels, a lot of back and forth. Some relationships, you only have one travel where you can show the person has met in person. Some relationships, you will have evidence of extensive WhatsApp communication and some you won't. Um, we've had relationships where they've had no, for example, Facebook photos or Instagram photos together, but we're able to work with the couple to provide other kinds of evidence to really show on paper that this is a bona fide relationship and they do have the intent of getting married. The second step of the process is um, to fill out the DS-160, but this is after the immigration form is filed with USCIS. USCIS has sent you a receipt, right? And the actual petition itself has been approved. So USCIS is the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services Agency. That's the US agency that approves immigration applications that are submitted. Once it's submitted and the immigrant is abroad, then they'll send the file to the National Visa Center, which is gonna be in the State Department. And they'll also, from there, the file will go to the in-person um, US consulate abroad. It's very important to know that the consulate that you choose has to be where the immigrant resides legally, lawfully. Because unfortunately, if your fiance is living in a third country and your fiance doesn't have a legal status, so they don't have a visa or a temporary 
residency in, in that country, the US consulate in that country doesn't have to receive them. So you wanna make sure that you select either the US embassy or consulate where your fiance resides or where your fiance is from. And once your file is actually at the embassy, you'll be able to fill out the DS-160 online, which is just basic information about the immigrant for her to be prepared for the in-person interview. The in-person interview at the US Embassy Abroad is extremely important. This is really your opportunity to show an immigration officer that all the information provided was correct, but also that it's a bona fide and real relationship. This is really interesting because a lot of these consulates do not allow the US citizen to even be there for the interview. It's really up to the discretion of the US Embassy or Consulate Abroad. So, and also each, each single US Embassy or Consulate has their own procedure and they update them all the time. So for us, for example, we have a lot of experience in the um, Canadian consulate as well as consulates in the Caribbean, especially in Haiti. So, but even though that's the case, every single time we have a client that's going to the in-person appointment, we'll double check all of the requirements, we'll walk our client through that because if everything really is in the, is in the fine tuning and is in the directions that you find online for your appointment. Um, some consulate want two copies of forms. Some consulate don't require that. Some consulates want three copies. Um, so it's really important to get ready for the interview. And something that's really interesting and I've seen take place, even though USCIS may have approved your fiance petition, which is the I-129F, the, immigrant, the immigration officer at the in-person interview still has the ultimate decision and authority to deny it. So if they believe that the relationship is not real, they can send your case back to USCIS and let them know they do not believe that it's a legitimate relationship and that approval should be rescinded. Um, I actually had a client, a potential client reach out to me um, because his fiance visa was denied because he didn't know the basic information about his petitioner, right? So oh, he went, that's... <laughs> <laughs> he went to the in-person appointment and he wasn't able to share his fiance's date of birth. He wasn't able to share the fiance's, um, her child's name in full. So the officer automatically believed that it wasn't a real relationship. You know, some people don't take these interviews seriously. So they'll just go thinking, listen, it's been approved already. It's obviously a real relationship. I don't have to prepare for it, but you really do have to prepare because any question that you get wrong can give the officer the ability to deny it because they believe that it wasn't legitimate. So suffice it to say that it's important to know the basic stuff about your significant other before go going into the really going into the interview. Um, yeah, for sure. Or essentially proving your relationship to this officer. And something that we do for our clients is before they go to the interview, we'll, when it's possible, we'll either do it over phone or by video, we'll have a mock interview. Um, and our mock interviews are always a lot tougher <laughs> than the in-person <laughs> but at least they're prepared, right? Um, right? And they have a chance to review and get prepared with their with their future spouse, so... Um, you really want to take them seriously. And at the in-person interview, you're going to be submitting your original documents. So for example, your original birth certificates, your original, um, any other, um, the background check, the medical, et cetera, all of that is going to be submitted in person. And you're also going to be submitting the financial documents of your petitioner at the in-person interview. Once the visa is approved and that visa is put on your passport, um, the visa is going to be good only for about four months, and you're going to have to come into the U.S. through a port of entry um, before your visa expired. So once you enter, you'll get an I-94, you'll get a stamp on your passport that says you entered as a K-1. And the next steps are to get legally married and to get ready to 
file for your green card application. And I know that this isn't the focus of this um, seminar, but one tip I will share is once you enter the US, it's really important. I know that you're not gonna have the ability to have a driver's license right away or ID, but it is important to start documenting um, the fact that you are residing with your future spouse. Um, whether it be, you know, getting put on your on your fiance's phone plan to show that you share a phone, or if you're being um, if you're ordering anything online through Amazon that it comes under your name, showing the same address. Just as soon as you enter the home and you guys actually start having that shared life together, anywhere that you go and you fill out an application, just showing that the address is the same. It's really important to start documenting the relationship, the continuation of the relationship as soon as you enter the US. Attorney, I have one question uh, from a viewer and that's, it's more so a conclusion, but I'm guessing it's a question as well. Does that mean that the fiance has to travel to the country of origin uh, in order to do the interview? So no, like I said, um, the immigrant, right? So the fiance that's abroad will mm -hmm. be able to do the in-person interview either at the US embassy in the country that they're currently in legally or at the US embassy in the country that they were born. So let's say for example, I'm a French citizen, but I am at school, I'm going to school and I'm currently in South Africa. If I have a student visa and I'm in South Africa, I can have my in-person interview either at the US consular embassy in South Africa or in France. But oh, I think the question was more so for the petitioner. Does the petitioner need to travel to the country where the fiance is doing the interview as well? So no. Um, and that's also gonna be very specific to the, to the US embassy or consulate because depending on the consulate that you're assigned, they will put on there, no one is allowed to enter the US embassy or consulate except for, and then they'll list um, either a translator or if you need help because you have a disability. And they will specifically put that the petitioner is not allowed to enter. Understood. Okay, so you know, let's say the interview goes well. Uh, what happens next after the, the visa is approved for the four months? Arrival into the U.S. and? And getting ready for that green card process. Okay. So let's talk about IMBRA. Um, so this is really great information to know. Um, the IMBRA is the International Marriage Broker Regulation Act, and it just makes it so that the U.S. has to provide a fiance um, their rights, which means their legal rights of being protected against um, being a victim of domestic violence or any other crimes from their U.S. citizen, US citizen petitioner. Now, it's Unfortunately, very often that some an immigrant comes to the US and they're being abused um, by their petitioner. And this is very sad. Um, we see this quite often. And this law makes it a requirement. And if you go online, everything is, is um, on the USCIS website. And also when the person gets their visa, they should also be given some information or pamphlet about this law that explains what is domestic violence, um, that explains sexual violence. And it's not only against the fiance, but it could be against the fiance's kids, for example. And um, we're not gonna dive too much into it for this seminar, but there is a special program in the United States where if you are married to a US citizen or even a lawful permanent resident, and you're able to show that you were a victim of the relationship, not necessarily that it was a bad relationship, but you were a victim of the relationship, you can qualify and self-petition for a green card. So that's gonna be through the VAWA program, which is the Violence Against Women's Act. Even though it's called that, both women and men can qualify. So for example, I have, I've had a few clients 
but I'm thinking of one specifically that have been men. Um, I've had men who've come from the Caribbean. They marry US citizen spouses of also Caribbean descent. But once they enter the US, those men are belittled. They're abused physically sometimes, emotionally abused and sexually abused. Um, it's not talked about very often, especially in, in some communities, but men who enter on a fiance visa sometimes are abused by the US citizen spouse and they will qualify to self-petition for a green card. And we've actually helped a few, a few of them get their green cards that way. You're absolutely right, attorney. We have helped uh, quite a few uh, VAWA cases. And um, for further information on the program, or if you have any doubts about your current situation, you can contact us at elisealawfirm.com uh, by filling out the submission form, or you can call us at 305-371-8846. I'm just going to do a publicity pause <laughs> for just a minute there. Um, but this is actually really good to know, attorney, because I think this could be one of our topic of discussions uh, for later on. And in fact, if you have any suggestions for us, in the meantime, you can definitely put it down in the chat and we can address those topics for a future webinar. Um, so attorney, what happens after my fiance arrives in the US? We just asked the question, feel free. So, um... We spoke about it earlier, but I wanted to touch upon it again, just because it's so important. It's important that um, you start documenting the relationship as soon as you enter. That's that's the first thing that you guys start residing together. You continue, you know, you continue to take photos together with family and friends. You plan the wedding. You have to get married within the ninety days. If you don't get married within the ninety days, and if you do end up getting married later on. What happens is you can go ahead and file for the green card, but then you have to file the I-130 along with your um, green card application. If you end up not getting married at all, then that's a bigger problem because now you're not going to be eligible to stay in the U.S. and get your green card through someone else because of the fact that you came in with a K-1. So if you do find yourself in a situation where you've entered the U.S., you have a K-1, um, you did not get married, you need to contact an immigration attorney as quickly as possible to figure out what your options are gonna be, okay? Thank you so much, attorney. Now, I think this is a big question that everybody has uh, in terms of process. This is not a question, this is a question that we get all the time in our firm. Uh, what are some of the associated costs that I can expect uh, for a process like this one? So besides, obviously the attorney's fees, the filing fee right now for the green card in the US, which is called adjustment of status is gonna be 1,225. Um, what that covers is the actual green card itself. Mm -hmm. It also covers a temporary work permit while the application is pending. You're requesting a social security number as well and a temporary travel document. Um, just a quick plug, USCIS did announce that they will be increasing these fees significantly. They haven't set a deadline as of yet, but that is something that we're gonna look at for, which is an ex it's gonna be, I think, more than doubling, um, if I'm not mistaken. So if anyone- You are not has mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> you are not mistaken, attorney. We actually discussed this in our, I think two webinars ago, uh, yeah. the prices are going significantly, significantly up. So if, any is a good time to start any of your AOS processes. I would highly suggest, and I know that the attorney highly recommends it as well, that you get started quickly. Okay, so um, attorney, is the K-1 process appropriate for my situation? Um, what are some of the pros, uh, cons and pros? So great question. Um, and it's really gonna, depend on the person's priority. Because when you do a K-1, when you enter the United States, you're entering with a fiance visa, you're not entering with a status. So some people um, may prefer 
to stay abroad longer, but when they enter the United States, they're gonna enter with that green card in their hand, right? Um, and some people may prefer to get married abroad, maybe because it's easier, maybe because their family members are abroad. So if your priority is to come into the US with an actual green card on your hand, where you, you're not worrying about getting married within the 90 days, and you're not worried about what's gonna happen with the petitioner when you enter the US, then um, the fiance visa is not for you, right? But the fiance visa typically takes a shorter amount of time than it does for a marriage-based green card. The reason that is, is because when you enter with the fiance visa, the only thing immigration is really focused on is the legitimacy of the relationship. So it goes a little faster because the National Visa Center is not collecting all of the financial documents from the petitioner and reviewing that. So typically, um, from what we've seen, let's say a fiance visa may take around eight to nine months, a marriage-based petition is gonna take at least twice as long. So if you go online, um, USCIS has implemented um, a page where you can see the processing times. So we double checked the processing times earlier today for the K-1 and online it's coming up as 16 months, but on a realistic level, it's really taking anywhere between six to 18 months and the average is nine months. So you're looking at a fiance visa average nine months um, and a green card petition that's gonna take longer than that for sure. And you also wanna consider your finances because as I stated earlier, if you're doing a green card marriage-based petition, you have to be ready to submit three years of taxes, letter of employment, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't have that, you need to have a co-sponsor ready to go so that you can pursue that green card for your significant other to enter. Good. Well, thank you so much for clarifying that for us, attorney. Um, so, what are, what are what are your thoughts? Like, uh, if you're trying to conclude the topic for us today, what are your conclusions for it? So, before we conclude, I know that we had a lot of inquiries about the parole program um the parole program versus the fiance visa and the parole program that i am speaking about specifically is the parole program that was initiated in january for cubans haitians nicaraguans and venezuelans um with the parole program the way that it works for those of you who are not familiar you have a u.s citizen or someone with a green card or someone with status in the u.s that files a request for you to enter the United States with parole, which is a temporary status for up to two years, um, and you file everything online. And what you're filing is the I-134A, which is very similar, which is basically the same thing as the I-134 that you would file for your fiance, but it's the I-134A for parole and parolees. Um, now, to take a step back, this whole parole program actually started in October of 2022 for nationals of Venezuela. And around January, um, they added to the Venezuelan program, Haiti, Cuba, and Nicaragua. What happened was when it came to it, the Venezuela program was very successful, but there was already starting to have a little bit of backlog. And when they added the additional countries, USCIS did not add enough immigration officers to take on these applications. So as of about a month ago, the numbers that were reported was around 1.5 million people have applied for parole and they're extremely backlogged. So the paroles, for Haitians right now, there's about 580,000 that they haven't gotten to and 380,000 for Cubans, 20,000 for Venezuelans and only 120 for Venezuelans and 20,000 for Nicaraguans. 
Um, according to reports, USCIS is receiving 12,000 parole applications every day. So in January, these parole applications were being adjudicated very quickly. We had people who were getting approved within hours, then it was a few days, um, then it turned into 90 days. And currently, unfortunately, we, we've seen and we have clients and we know of people who have been waiting for the parole applications to be approved since the end of January, we're already at the end of July. And this is a big problem because we have people that have been waiting now for parole to be approved for over six months. And we don't know um, how quickly they're gonna be able to adjudicate these applications to the point that immigration recently made an announcement half of the applications they're going to take them as they come in while the other half is going to be kind of the best way i can describe it is a lottery right so if you've been already waiting for um parole for four months five months there's no guarantee of exactly when they're going to get to your application the problem that we're seeing is that people are applying several times they have several applications. It's creating a backlog. So, and one of the announcements that immigration made is they said that they will start rejecting multiple applications. Um, but I don't know how effective, how effectively they're going about doing that. And also, there are people who've applied for parole and they will not use it. I've heard of a lot of silly reasons for people to say they're not gonna use their approved parole. Either um, they didn't really wanna come to the US, right? Well, my family applied for me, but I didn't really wanna come. I allowed them to do it, but I thought about it and I don't wanna come anymore. Well, that spot that they took is someone else's spot that really wanted to come in. Um, or we have people who have applied and the applications are incomplete, so it's taking a lot longer to adjudicate in certain circumstances, which is very sad, we've had people who've applied for parole and they've passed away. They've passed away waiting for the parole to be approved, but their application and their spots are still there. Um, are you allowed to have a fiance visa at the same time as a parole application? Absolutely. You're allowed to have um, someone petition for you for parole as well as for a fiance visa. Does your fiance have to be the one to file for you for parole? No, they do not. So if you're engaged to someone in the US and you have and they're not able to petition for you because maybe they don't have the time or they don't have the required documents right now to be able to send, to be able to parole for you, can someone else do it? Yes. Because for the parole program, you don't have to have a relationship with the, with the person applying for you, unlike a marriage-based or a fiance-based application. Um, what is the biggest difference between a fiance visa and a parole is, don't forget, for a fiance visa, once you come in, you have to get married to the person who petitioned for you. For the parole application, there's no requirement of marriage, which is really interesting because we've seen a little bit of drama happening there, right? <laughs> um, we've definitely seen some circumstances where a US citizen who has a pending um, fiance application files for, some, for that same person to come in on parole because of the fact that they came in on parole that immigrant does not pursue the marriage anymore because they're no longer obligated to. Um, you can definitely come in. So if you're, let's say you're married, to, you're, you're engaged to a US citizen. They filed a fiance visa petition for you. They don't have the required documents. You have an uncle, you have a friend, that does parole for you, you come in on the Biden parole program, you marry someone else, 
that's also okay. Because that fiance visa is again, a fee, it's an application for you to come in with a visa. It's not an application for you to get a green card. So if you come in on the Biden program, are you obligated to get married to your US citizen fiance? No, you're not. So there's, you know, you just have to kind of weigh um, what's going on in your personal life, what's going on in your finances, what's going on with your family, with your friends, et cetera, and also the time. So like we said, you know, technically right now, according to USCIS, it's taking around 18 months. On a practical level, have we seen it go faster? Yes. Practically speaking right now, fiance visas are taking around nine months. It's not guaranteed. No one can guarantee you how quickly an application is gonna be approved by immigration. And again, I've seen immigrants get fooled into paying up to $2,000 to try to expedite a case because, well, that person said they know someone who's an immigration officer, et cetera. That's never gonna work. That's money you will never see again. There are ways to expedite a pending application. However, you have to show that there's extreme, um, like there's a situation that's extreme. Because don't forget, everyone is in the same situation. Everyone is waiting for USCIS to get to your case. If you are requesting to expedite, it's because you have an emergency. So you really have to be able to show, prove, and document that emergency. If you have a medical emergency or a family emergency or anything else, then yes, we can. they will definitely consider that when it comes to your, the adjudication of your, um, of your application. So just to kind of finish with this slide so that we can get to the next one. Overall with the fiance visa process, right now it's taking about nine months, but it can be a little faster or it could take longer. Um, you have to get married to a US citizen and when you're your citizen petitioner. And when you do, we didn't really touch a lot about this today, but if you're coming in as a fiance, as a fiance on a fiance visa, your children will also be able to come in with you. Attorney, I have a question from the public right now, and they are kind of wondering if, are we, is someone able to get married while on a B1, B2 visa while they're in the US? All right, can you go to the next slide? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything and then I'll be happy to answer um, that question, any other questions that we may get. Okay. So something that's really important is the docu documentation, documentation, documentation. The success of your fiance visa packet, your parole packet, your green card packet, your TPS packet, your anything packet with USCIS is how well it's documented and it's presented. Um, because of the fact that this is basically what we do, we are able to see the red flags um, and we can help minimize them so that when your application is sent that you have a higher chance of it actually getting approved. What's the next slide? Okay, so why hire an attorney help you with the process? Again, experience. Um, something that we do offer a lot is the follow-ups. So depending on the kind of case, we will have we'll either do the follow-ups on our own or we'll actually have a staff member call USCIS with you on the phone so that you can hear for yourself as well what the immigration officer is saying. Very often, um, clients tell us, we're not able to get someone on the phone when we call USCIS. We know how to get someone on the phone. We so are good at that. Call, <laughs> <laughs> so if we call, we will talk to someone. Um, and if we need to speak to a supervisor, we will we'll request it. So um, that's definitely something to consider. Your package will be stronger and you'll have peace of mind. Okay, um, something to consider that I think that you did mention and I think is very important to reiterate is that every case is different. So right. um, one of the many reasons to hire an attorney is that because every case is different, your situation is not going to be the same as maybe somebody you know's situation. So you always want to get the concept of a, a qualified, a highly qualified immigration attorney. Um, we do offer the service 
to assist you and guide you through your process. Uh, and we are offering uh, we are offering a complimentary uh, consultation with the attorney after this uh, webinar is over. You can call us at 305-371-8846. You can also message us through our website or to our email directly, which is listed in our messages below elisealawfirm.com or you can email us directly as well. Um, and we will be happy to schedule that consultation with you. Um, we do not have any restrictions in terms of location, geographic location. We do video calls, phone calls, um, and we are also available for in-person consultations. We are located in Miami, Florida. And um, yeah, we'll be happy to get started on your immigration process, your K-1 journey, uh, and also your adjustment of status journey if you're already in the US. So um, I saw that someone had raised their hand. If they could please type the question in the, in the chat and I'll be happy to answer the question live. So can you get married with a tourist visa? Absolutely. Um, if you enter the US with a tourist visa, you are allowed to get married um, before your I-94 expires or even after your I-94 expires. Your I-94 being your family residual, which shows you how long you're able to physically stay in the US before you go out of status. Um, typically, you know, we have clients who reach out to us either before they get married or after they get married. If you're reaching out to us before you get, you get married, we can kind of guide you a little bit on the timing of the marriage versus the traveling back and forth. But the most important thing to consider is, are you gonna be able to show that your intent was to be remain a tourist, right? And then you just so happen to maybe change your mind after you entered, um, got married, and from there, you're seeking to get your green card through your, um, your relationship. So go ahead, Lanos. I do see your you typing hello. Go ahead and ask your question, and we'll be happy to to answer it for you. Okay. Okay. All right. While we wait for Lanos to answer a question, I have another question. Uh, somebody's asking: uh, Is it possible for me to travel while on my K one visa during the ninety day period? No. So. The, the K-1 visa is gonna be for you to enter once. Um, it's not for you to be traveling back and forth. It's not a 90 day visa or however long. So typically the visas are very short. The visa is for you to enter the US. It's not for you to travel back and forth. It's for you to enter once and to actually get married to your petitioner when you're PTP. And I wouldn't recommend it. Why do you wanna go? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> As a, um, so as an immigrant, you know, it's very important to understand that when you're traveling the US, there's no guarantee of being allowed to come in. The only people that are guaranteed to, uh, that are guaranteed entry are US citizens. Green card holders are not guaranteed re-entry. A travel permit is not guaranteed re-entry. Um, a tourist visa, an ESTA, not guaranteed re-entry. So until you actually have something solid in your hand, I would highly recommend that you avoid traveling back and forth, especially if you already have a process in place. I see a question here in Haitian Creole, which is how long does the K-1 process take? So this is something that we went over. Um, the K-1 process, as we said, right now, according to immigration, is taking about um, 18 months but what we're seeing with our cases is that on average is taking about nine months. So it really kind of just depends on when immigration gets your file. Um, we have noticed that the cases that are being filed right now are being processed a lot faster than cases that were filed a year ago or two years ago. And this is in all categories, green card applications, um, fiance visas, I-90s, which is green card um, renewals. So for example, um, the last green card renewal that we filed, from the time that we filed the green card renewal to the time that the client had it in their hand was six weeks, which is very quick considering because 
before it was taking a few months and under the Trump era, unfortunately it was taking a little bit more than a year. But the cases that are being filed today from what we're seeing in the office and what we're seeing also from other attorneys are being adjudicated a lot faster. And the reason that is, is because the Biden administration is really going out of its way to implement policies to try to catch up with the backlog that they have and also to try to see how quickly they can um, approve applications. So for example, in the green card process, um, they are no longer requiring in-person interviews. Can you go to that last slide again? I think we got um, pushed from there. Okay. Oh, let me see. No, the one after that, the one after that, the one after that. <laughs> <laughs> are we saying after are we saying? <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to make sure that they have the phone number and the email if they want to get in contact with us so just the very last slide um <laughs> so you know for example USCIS has really they're trying and and we're seeing it they're really implementing a lot of changes to make the applications go quicker um with the green card process like I was saying uh you know a year ago, you were required to go to an in-person interview. It, did, it didn't matter whether it was a marriage-based petition or if it was a parent-child relationship, you were required to go to that in-person appointment at the local USCIS office. I haven't been to an in-person appointment now in a, over a year. Reason being is number one, we send strong packages, but number two, where, immigration, where the immigration officer on your file feels comfortable with what you've filed they have the ability to waive that in-person appointment. And that speeds up the case significantly. So that's one of the things that the Biden administration has done to make things go a lot faster. Something else that's happened is that um, the Biden administration is also waiving fingerprint appointments where they have your fingerprints on file already. So before, for every single application you filed, they had you go in and get your fingerprints done. But if you already have TPS, if you already have a green card and you're filing for something else, now immigration is saying there's no need to go back and actually do your fingerprints again, which is again, expediting the adjudication of the new application that USCIS is receiving. Okay, right. attorney, we have actually one more question. It says, if my fiance is living in Dominican Republic, not legally without status, uh, can they still process the K-1 and DR instead of Haiti? So this is gonna be up to the discretion of the, of the US embassy that they're going to. So this case, the DR, but the general law is, there's gonna be two places that they can do it. They have to be living in that country legally. So if they're not in DR legally, the Dominican Republic is not required to give her or him the fiance visa. So you can go through all of this process. You go to the appointment. They, they may not give you an appointment or if they find out last minute or they, it slips through the cracks, they can say they're going to reject it. And then it's going to take some time now for the case to be sent to Haiti, which is, I guess, where that person was born. So again, the in-person appointments, this is for any kind of visas has to be at the country where the person is residing lawfully or where the person is from. Okay, well, attorney, that actually, um, that really explain. I think today's webinar was really informative, particularly when we relate it to the parole cases that we discussed towards the end of it. Um, you know, I just wanna point out that we are offering free consultations for the participants of today's webinar. Um, if you have any questions regarding your particular, very specific immigration case, please reach out to us via our phone number 305-371-8846. Um, we have elisealawfirm.com, which is our website, or you can reach out to us by email, which is intro at elisealawfirm.com. Um, let us know that you are a part of this webinar and we will offer you that uh, consultation one-on-one -on -one with the attorney in order to discuss your immigration 
uh, concerns directly. And Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it was definitely fun to kind of get into the K-1 process a little bit in detail. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I'm, we are looking forward to helping you guys with your immigration cases. Um, I'm an immigrant. I've been through the process. I understand um, how important it is and we take our job very seriously. Um, so looking forward to hearing from you and seeing exactly what's going on with you and your family and how we can be best of service. And like Catalina said, anything that you guys want us to focus on, please let us know. Um, we actually did the fiance this seminar because we noticed we were getting a lot of questions about the fiance visa process. So if you guys are interested in a seminar in a specific area within immigration, you know, we're happy to kind of customize that for you. We absolutely are. Thank you so much for this evening and for your attendance. Have a great one. Bye everyone.